Good morning. It's great to it's great to see all of you here. It's great to hear everybody's voices. It's great to see the joy that, that we have when we get together to worship the Lord and as we continue to to get more and more back and we encourage everyone. We have a lot of people that are traveling. We've got some big, some of our big families that are all, all gone at the same time. But uh, I'm very, very thankful to see all of you here this morning as well. And any visitors, we're, we're really thankful about that. Before I forget uh, and we go into our call of worship this morning, I, I did, Chris brought to my attention, and I wanted to let you guys know that Kaya Williams, which is Nathan and Rebecca's daughter, uh, was baptized the other day, so we wanted to make sure that we let everyone know that and, and celebrate with Kaya and with the Williams family in regards to that. So that's wonderful news, wonderful news. Um, in relation to the call to worship this morning, um, I want to talk just a moment. Terry's going to be getting into more detail this morning in relation to seeing Jesus through David. And I want to leave you or start your thought process this morning for our worship service. And I really want you to think about this. Uh, it's pretty elementary at, at surface, but it's really deep when we start thinking about it and the significance of it. But if you remember in, in 1 Samuel in chapter 24, David, he's fleeing from Saul. As we all know, Saul is after him. He's been after him. He's wanting to kill David. And David is, is in a cave, he and his men deep back in this cave. And Saul has turned his attention once again to, to after leaving some battles, he's turned his attention again to seeking out David. And he goes into the cave, as the scriptures say, to relieve himself. And he goes in, and the men look up, and they say, Look, the Lord has delivered him into your hands. There is Saul. It's done. You, I mean, easy. David snuck up on Saul, and he cut off a corner of his robe. And Saul never knew it. And his men said, No, it's It's time. You got to do this. You can kill your enemy. You can do this now. And Saul convinced them, he is the Lord's anointed, and I'm not going to raise my hand against him. And Saul left that cave not knowing until David went out and yelled to him. And Saul realized who it was, and he held up the corner that, or he he told him, "I've cut that off. I could have killed you. I don't want to kill you." That's not my desire. Now I want you to think about that. If that had been you, what would you have done? Each of us have to answer that for ourselves. But I know what Jesus Christ did for us. Jesus Christ did just exactly what David did. He had mercy. He had mercy on one who was a sinner. He had mercy on one who was trying to kill him. Have you ever thought about that? We're all guilty of sin. We're all guilty of putting Jesus upon that cross. And I want us to think about the mercy that was shown and the willingness of David to follow God. And the willingness of Jesus Christ to also follow His commandments. Let's think about it this morning as we start. Let's stand and sing together, Hosanna. Mm -hmm. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest.
Next song this morning will be oh, Worship the King. No soul, oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light. It streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Children of dust and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our Maker, Defender, Redeemer. song will be Hallelujah, What a Savior. Though we so man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of Start that again. I apologize. Got a little bit of something going on. <clears throat> Is that down to so or up to so? Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that you blessed us with. We are thankful for the 
for the time that we have to come out to worship you, to study you, to study your word. We are thankful for it. And we're thankful for all that we have. May the things that we say and we do be pleasing to you and that we are a light to those in this community. We're mindful of Katie Taylor. We're thankful for the improvements that she has made. And we're also praying that she continues to improve as she could and that she could come out and worship with us again one day. Be with Austin and the rest of the family and strengthen them. Continue to be with them. As we go through this service, let us not forget that Jesus is our King and our Savior and has been prophesied before. He is a king after the order of Melchizedek, a priest and king. That we serve Him, that we love Him and do what He asks us to do according to His will and that we be like Him in our lives. As we go through this service, help us to focus on this on this message that we should be like him and that one day we hope to join him in heaven and sit around that throne with him there. Be with us. Help us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. We just sang a song about what our King did for us and how He is a Savior for us. And there are some times when I observe the Lord's Supper when I forget why He is considered our King. And when you think of kingship, we, I grew up seeing all of these movies and all of these team show, uh, TV shows kind of illustrating what a basic king would be. And when you think of a kingship and you think of a king, you think of power. When you think of a kingship, you think of a large kingdom and a large capital supported by fortified walls and also supported by a large army force that will lay his life for that king. And when you think of a king, you think of a nation that would lay their own lives for their country as well. But when you think of a king, you also think of a king who was well-respected, not only by his people, but other nations as well, and feared. And most importantly, when you think of a successful kingship, you have to include a king who would be willing to lay his life down for others. And our king did that for us. And there is something remarkable about Jesus' sacrifice for that. That, of course, goes without saying, after all, he did give himself up for us. While we were still enemies to God, I might add. But also beyond that, there is something remarkable about the way our king gave his life for us. First thing I ask that you consider is Christ in the upper room. After celebrating the Passover, he kneels to wash the disciples' feet to teach them a lesson about being servants. And he takes the time to warn Peter as well about his arrogance and caution him about the night's coming events. And we'll get to that in a few, few seconds. But he also spends a great deal of time comforting and preparing all of the disciples in that room about his impending departure. And then also instructing, instructing them about the coming hours and coming events. We also consider about Christ in the garden. And even in the midst of praying about his own fears, 
He knows that his desire, desire is not of ultimate importance here, but rather he wakes the disciples up and warns them to be watchful, to pray that they won't fall into temptation. And then when, do, when these soldiers do come and arrest him, he stops whatever is happening to kneel down and, in, and to heal an injured slave. And the next thing is you must consider Jesus at his trial. Uh, in this, the biggest sham of a trial that is ever recorded and has been performed, Christ had every right to be indignant about the violation of his rights and of every legal and ethical standard. But yet, when he heard the rooster crow, he took the time to find Peter standing in the middle of that courtyard and give him that look, the convincing yet loving and reassuring look that was needed to drive Peter into repentance. I ask you then to consider Christ on the road to the cross, and then after he had been sentenced, we find Christ carrying his cross to Golgotha while a group of women follow him and weep over him. And again, he stops everything so he can turn around and warn them of the coming destruction of which they should be weeping about. I ask you finally consider Christ on the cross. And when every breath was precious and every word was agonizing and every small little movement must have been excruciating, Christ remained concerned about others. He looked out for the spiritual well-being of those crucifying him as he says, Father, forgive them. He also worries about the thief hanging right beside him, saying, you will be with me in paradise. And he worries about mankind as he says, if the plan to redeem is finished. He looked out for the physical well-being of his mother as well as he says, woman, behold your son to John. And he concerned himself with the fulfillment of the prophecy as he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I thirst. So we can see that something remarkable about how Jesus faced the last few hours of his life and the last few days, I might add. A life designing to bring him to the cross, certainly he was fully aware of what was facing him. And he must have known that he was about to undergo the most excruciating most horrific method of execution that has ever been desired and devised and invented. And there is no doubt that Christ had every right to be preoccupi preoccupied with himself and his immediate future, but yet everything that Christ did and said and acted upon as he approached the cross had something else as his focus. Just as he had lived his entire life, so why is it that sometimes we have such a hard, hard time focusing on him? That is a question I leave with y'all today as we prepare our minds and focus on the Lord's Supper for all the events and for all the actions that our King did for us. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Why not take time out and focus on him? We now give prayer for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day that you have provided us and a wonderful opportunity to sit with our family and loved ones and to, to worship you. God, at this time specifically, we ask that you prepare us and focus on our minds on your son, our king, who laid his life for us lowly sinners. We thank you for the bread and the flesh that he gave on that cross for our sins for a second chance. Your son's name we pray. Amen.
Let us now pray for the cup. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for the time that you've given us to, to praise you and to glorify you and to focus on your word. God, we thank you so much for your son who laid his life for us, who gave us another opportunity to rewrite our lives and keep our light shining for you, God. We thank you so much for the blood that your son shed for us and the covenant that was made. And we, we ask that you be with us every step of the way. In your son's name we pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. This morning's Bible reading will be 1 Samuel 8, verses 4 through 9. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, Give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And as they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Good morning. It wasn't very good. Y'all sound asleep. Good morning. It's a little bit better. It is good to be with you. Let me begin by saying, first off, if you have the outline, yes, the title is wrong at the top of it. My daughter pointed that out as soon as she saw that. And uh, as your children always do, they love to find your mistakes. So uh, that is not the title, but it is the correct outline, and hopefully you pick that up. It was just read for us from 1 Samuel 8 when the people asked Samuel for a king. And I think what is interesting about that request is that God knew already that one day his people would want a king. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, in verse 14, Moses there is he's preparing in the last month of his life, and right before they cross the Jordan, and retelling the law to these people, he says there in Deuteronomy 17 and 14, when you come to the land the Lord your God has given you, you possess it and dwell in it and will say, I will set a king over me like all the nations around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose, one from among your brothers who you shall set as a king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Well before, well before the days of Samuel, before anybody had ever said anything about a king, the law of Moses addresses that moment. You're going to ask for a king. It was not if you do this, but when you do this. What is interesting is that despite God's provision already for what happens in 1 Samuel 8, Samuel seems to be surprised by the request, doesn't he? 
He's troubled by it. In fact, he views it as a rejection of himself. And God explains to him, he says, Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Where Curtis left off in verse 9, God says, make sure you tell the people what's going to happen when they get this king. And so in verses 11 through 18, Samuel goes through all the things that are going to happen when God gives them a king, that he's going to tax them and he's going to take their stuff and use it for his own pleasure. He's going to take their children and he's going to make them serve him. He's going to take a tenth of all that they have. He's going to use their sons to fight battles. He's going to do all of these things. And it's going to come out that one day they're going to be upset that they have a king. And God's going to remind them, this is what you asked for. Because this is what comes along with a king. And so, Israel gets their first king. And it is interesting to see that Israel's first king is exactly what you would expect from a king. God gives them what they want. They wanted, as Curtis read from 1 Samuel 8 and verse 5, they wanted a king to judge us like all the other nations have. And even after Samuel's warning in chapter 8, in verse 19 through 20, it says the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and said, no, there shall be a king over us that we may be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us in battle. Despite all that Samuel warned them, they come back and say, no, we want a king. By the way, when you look at Leviticus 11, One of the things you see is that this was one of God's greatest concerns when he brought the children out of Egypt, was this desire that they wanted to be like everybody else, because what God wanted was for them to be different than anybody else. In Leviticus 11, 44 and 45, for I am the Lord your God, consecrate yourselves, therefore be holy, for I am holy. You shall not defile yourselves with any swarming thing that crawls on the ground, for I am the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You therefore be holy, for I am holy. This concept of holiness, God is saying, I'm holy, I'm different, you be different too. You be holy. You be unlike all these people around you. And part of that, was this idea of a king ruling over them. God was their king. And well, by the way, well before 1 Samuel 8, the people had failed to understand that. The book of Judges closes with with this idea of, in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. The problem with that statement is there was a king in Israel. Jehovah was their king. But they failed to recognize that. Because they wanted a king like everybody else. So what does a king look like? For a moment, think about all those Disney movies you've watched. Because princes become kings, right? That's how that works. So what do princes look like? Well, they're good looking. And they're strong and they're brave and they're imposing. They've... They're charismatic. They're charming. That's what a king should look like. He should look like this charming, handsome person. And while Saul didn't fit all of those things, admittedly, he did fit one that was most important. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, in the first two verses, it says, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Becherah, the son of Appiah, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward he was taller than all of the people. Saul was handsome, he was tall, he was imposing, he looked like a king. But he didn't act like a king. At least not the kind of king God wanted. I mean, Saul starts off well. He defeats the Amorites and he defeats the Philistines and looks promising. He 
He gets out of the block, if you take the race analogy. He gets out of the block good. But it doesn't last long. In 1 Samuel 14, his son shows more courage than he does in the pursuit and defeat of the Philistines. In the midst of battle, Saul makes a rash vow that should be uncharacteristic of a strong, godly king that almost cost his son's life. And in 1 Samuel chapter 15, they go and fight the Amalekites, and God has already declared from back in the days of the wilderness that Amalek will cease to exist. And he calls Saul and the people to bring this judgment on Agag and the Amalekites. And he tells Saul, don't let anything live. So in 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 8, And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And devoted to the destruction of all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen and the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not destroy them. All this was despised and worthless they devoted to destruction. The Lord, the word of the Lord came to Samuel and he says, I regret that I have made Saul king for he's turned back from following me, has not performed my commandments. You might remember that story that Samuel shows up. And he goes, what is this? I hear, I hear sheep. Saul tries to go, well, it's not me, it's the people. They want to worship God. What you need to understand here is that God ends up in verses 22 and 23 rejecting Saul because he disobeyed God. And that's where that statement is made. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Saul was presumptuous. He was rebellious. He did not follow what God had said. Saul looked like a king, but he did not act like a king in the way that God wanted. Which leads us to the unexpected king in the early days of Israel. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, God sends Samuel to find a replacement and a king for Israel. And the Lord says there to Samuel, where he's grieving, how long will you grieve over Saul since I've rejected him? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And he said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, do you come peacefully? And he said, peaceably, I've come to sacrifice the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons. And invite him to the sacrifice. What's interesting is how the story progresses. What would you do if you were Samuel? You come to Jesse's house. He has numerous sons. How do you determine which one is the king? The same way you typically determine who's a king. Who's the tallest? Who's the most handsome? Who's the most charming? Who's the most authoritative? Maybe who's the oldest? Who has fought more for Israel in battle. Who would that be? And so in verse 6 of 1 Samuel 16, Samuel begins with the oldest of the house. That's where you would presume to start. And when they came, he looked at Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his statue because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Samuel called Abinadab and made him pass, the Lord, uh, Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse uh, made Shammah pass by. Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Can you imagine Jesse's surprise when his seven oldest sons have all paraded in front of God's servant Samuel looking for the one who would be king and every time here are the seven oldest, the most authoritative, the tallest, the most experienced and Samuel keeps saying, nope, not him. 
And so in verse 11, Samuel says, are all your sons here? And Jesse says, well, there's the youngest, but he's out keeping the sheep. And Jesse said, send him and get him. We will not sit down till he comes. I love the way Jesse answers it. Well, yeah, I've got, I've got the youngest one. He, he's out keeping sheep. Surely you can't be talking about him. What's interesting here is David's absence. Where is David? I mean, where is Jesse, excuse me, and his sons? Well, Jesse and the three oldest, we are told, go and worship with Samuel. But David is so overlooked, at least in the family dynamic, and so much younger than the other brothers that he's not even taken to worship with Samuel and the offering of the sacrifice. He's the youngest. He has almost no expectations. He's just out keeping the sheep. And yet they send for him, and it says, by the way, he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. David was the least expected to be chosen king by his own father. And by his own family. But David was God's choice. Some think that David, seem to think that David was unattractive, but the Bible tells us that's not so. David was good looking. He had beautiful eyes. Some assume he was short because after all, Saul's armor didn't fit him in 1 Samuel 17. But I would remind you that According to the description, Saul's armor would have not fit anybody in Israel, not just David. I don't want us to overplay David's stature and looks. He wasn't unattractive. He's not short and looked down upon necessarily. In fact, a short time later, David is pictured wearing armor in 1 Samuel 18 and verse 4. He's pictured wearing Jonathan's armor. Who would you assume would be full grown? And we so overlook David that even the children's song we sing, and probably incorrectly, only a little boy David, only a babbling brook. But the reality is, David's kept at home in the story of David and Goliath to tend to the flocks while his older brothers are out fighting. It wasn't because he was a boy that he stayed home, it was because he was the youngest. And he was allowed to stay home and to take care of the things of his family. I think what is interesting that even proves that David is not a child in 1 Samuel 18 is two things. First off, he picks up the sword of a giant and cuts off the giant's head. That's not typical strength for a 13-year-old. And immediately after the defeat of Goliath, we find out that he is taken and put in charge of a command over troops in 1 Samuel 18. Again, not normally done with children. A little boy David would be an odd commander for a battalion of troops. So what is the big deal then about David being selected as king? Well, in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, which we read, it is important to put this back in. This is the big deal. Do not look on his appearance or the height of his statue because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. It doesn't mean that David is ugly or difficult to look at. But what it means is among the eight children of Jesse, only one had the heart God was looking for to sit on his throne. And that was the youngest, David. And hundreds of years later, in places like Acts 13 and verse 22, David is remembered for being a man after God's own heart. And David becomes arguably the most successful king in the history of Israel. It's between him and Solomon. David enlarges the boundaries of Israel. David goes in and drives out the Jebusites 
from Jerusalem and controls the city and makes it God's city, dedicates it to the Lord. It is David that expands and removes enemies and establishes the capital. And while we know of his sins with Bathsheba and what that does and the house full of turmoil, we still look at him as the greatest king of Israel. But David was more than a king. He was a fulfillment of prophecies going back to the end of Genesis where there Jacob blesses Judah and talks about the lion of Judah and the scepter not departing. It is with David that the royal lineage of the tribe of Judah begins and is established. And it is through David that the commands of Genesis or the promises of Genesis 12 and verses 1 through 3 will be fulfilled. But as the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it is through David's bloodline that the one who will bless all the families of the earth would come. And David is given an interesting promise in 2 Samuel chapter 7, in verses 12 through 16. When your days are fulfilled, and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne uh, of his kingdom forever, and I will be to him a father, and he shall be to my, me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. The throne shall be established forever. God tells David, your throne will be established forever. Now, we could look at the rest of the history of the Hebrew Bible and the story of Israel, and we could trace the lineage of David from king to king in the southern kingdom up until its demise carried off into captivity in Babylon. But I can tell you that those earthly kings is not the fulfillment of that promise we just read in 2 Samuel 7 of your throne being established forever. That as we've already looked at this morning in so many ways in our songs, in our call to worship, in our memory of Jesus around the table, that all of those things and this promise point and direct us to Jesus who is our unexpected king today. When Jesus arrives in the history of the world, if you will, Israel is waiting and looking for a king. They are aware of the promises of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and made to David. They're expecting a king. They were expecting a king for years. First, one who would deliver them from the Greek Empire, and now one who will deliver them from the Roman Empire. They're anxiously awaiting this new king who will come in, defeat the impressive empire of Rome, and reestablish the throne in Jerusalem, God's people, and Israel being a dominant world power. That's what they're waiting for. And so they would look at the lineage of David. And what do you think they looked for? Well, someone who was noble. Someone who was charming and charismatic and good looking. And i got to be honest with you. We may not admit it, but we think the same thing about Jesus today. When you think about the picture of Jesus in your mind, what comes to mind? I mean, classic Jesus in our culture is Caucasian with long flowing hair and a nicely trimmed beard and piercing blue eyes. That's the picture of Jesus. In fact, it's not new. In 1514, there was a document written or found written under the name of Publius Lentulus, which was a Roman governor that followed Pontius Pilate. Now, what is interesting is this document has been proven to be a forgery. But listen to the description of Jesus in this forgery. He is a tall man, well-shaped, and of an amiable and reverend aspect. His hair is of a color that can hardly be matched, falling into graceful curls, parted on the crown of his head, running as a stream to the front after the fashion of the Nazarites, 
his forehead high, large, and imposing, his cheeks without spot or wrinkle, beautiful with a lovely red, his nose and mouth formed with exquisite symmetry, his beard and of a color suitable to his hair, reaching below his chin and parted in the middle like a fork, his eyes bright, blue, clear, and serene. Now this is kind of that Hollywood actor Jesus. In fact, you might have seen those pictures of Jesus with that blonde flowing locks of hair, nicely shaped beard, blue eyes, that sometimes is somewhat accommodatively called surfer Jesus because it's kind of what he looks like. And by the way, that's what we want Jesus to look like. We want him to look attractive and like a king. That's what you're supposed to look like. It's interesting that the British Broadcasting Network once used a very pudgy actor to portray, portray Jesus in a film. And when they had the film reviewed, the film was rejected because they didn't like the actor playing Jesus. Because heroes are supposed to be tall and slender and handsome. Not pudgy and unattractive. But that's not what God had planned for Jesus. I just got to be honest with you, the reality is we are told in places like Isaiah 53 that Jesus wasn't going to look like a king. Isaiah 53 verses 2 and 3, for he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and esteemed, we esteemed him not. You know what that prophecy seems to say? is Not only was Jesus not attractive, you might have tried to hide from looking at him. That's not the physical representation we have in our minds of Jesus at all, is it? And not only did he not look like a king, he didn't act like a king, he didn't arrive like a king. He was a root out of dry ground. He wasn't born to noble parents. In fact, from a worldly standpoint, he is an illegitimate child. Born to a virgin woman before she was even married. And he's not born in the city of kings in Jerusalem. He's born with a livestock and a house in Bethlehem. And he wasn't raised up in Judah. He's raised up in the region of Galilee that was known for people being uneducated. That's not what a king should look like. And he didn't act like a king. Courageous and without any weakness. Maybe you never thought of it this way, but Jesus is pretty emotional. I mean, in John eleven thirty five, 35, he is weeping for a friend. In Mark 1, 41, he feels sympathy where a man with leprosy. In Matthew 12, 34, he angrily blasts the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. In Matthew 22, 37, he openly weeps over Jerusalem and their rejection. In John 2, he makes a whip and he drives people in rage out of the temple. It's not kingly behavior that seems to be emotionally all over the place. And he didn't hang out with who he should hang out with. Jesus doesn't go hang out with the Sanhedrin and the rulers of the day. He doesn't get close to Herod. In fact, he hung out with all the wrong people. In Luke 5.30, the Pharisees and the scribes grumble, saying, Why do you eat with tax collectors and sinners? In Luke 15, it says the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, This man receives sinners and eats with them. I mean, this is not who you're supposed to associate with. Get away from those poor people. Get away from those rotten sinners. And not only did he not hang out with the right people, but he rebuked the wrong people. He spends his time rebuking the religious elite. Matthew 5 and verse 20, where he says there, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. That's not a kingly statement, by the way. A kingly statement would be trying to win over the scribes and Pharisees. I'm here to reestablish us. And yet Jesus comes in and says, don't be like them. Those guys are the worst. That's what Jesus says. 
And in Matthew 23, it gets even more harsh in his rebuke and directed at the Pharisees, who were the best of the best. In Matthew 23, 2 and 3, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe what they tell you, but not what they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. And in verse 13, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves or allow those who would enter to go in. I mean, these are the people that all of Israel would have thought would be supporting and promoting the king of Israel. And Jesus comes in and says, I don't want anything to do with you. Jesus looked nothing like a king. Nothing like a king. So they rejected him. In John 19, I just want to take this excerpt out of the scene leading up to crucifixion. I just want you to listen to the words when you remove them from all the surrounding context. Because we know what's coming, but just listen to these words. It was the day of preparation for the Passover about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, this is Pilate, behold your king. And they cry out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. This was God's king. And they said, no. We have no king but Caesar. Do you see that these people who could not wait for the king to come and to overthrow Rome, so rejected Jesus that they wanted to stay under the rule of Caesar instead of him. But that's how the king of kings arrived. In the most unexpected way. In a way that all rejected, except for just a few That's how God planned it. Isn't it interesting how often God's plans are the exact opposite of what we think the plan should be? And in Isaiah 53, it said that they would reject him. They wouldn't even look upon him. And that reminds me of Isaiah 55, which talks about How that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and His ways are not our ways. See, if you and I were to write the Bible story, the greatest story that's ever been written, well, we'd write it differently, wouldn't we? Jesus would be beautiful and attractive and handsome and mighty. He would be an all-American in every sense of the way. I guess all Israelites, the way to say that. He would be raised up like Paul, being taught the Jewish law to serve on the Sanhedrin. He would surpass all of those in his class. He would establish his royal blood. He would be raised within the city walls. He'd be raised near where the palace would sit. That's what king stories look like to us. It certainly wouldn't end on an old rugged cross with a public execution and then laid in a borrowed tomb. And if that were the end of the story, well, then I would tell you that Jesus isn't our king. But three days later, that tomb was empty. And Jesus proved that he was the king of kings. And eventually he ascended and he sat on the throne. You see, when we circle back to Israel, they wanted a king, but they wanted the king they wanted. They wanted the king to do what they wanted him to do and to look like the way they wanted to look. They wanted to be like everybody else. 
And that failed. And eventually God came and brought David, a king that nobody would have expected, who became the greatest king that country ever had. And in the same way, you and I might think about what we think the king should look like, but God gave us a king that was so unlike what people expected that he was completely rejected. And that leaves you and I with a choice today. That like the people in Jesus' time, we can completely reject him as the king of our life. And we can go about and do whatever we want. And we can decide that he won't rule over our life. And by the way, I think that's the way we really respond a lot of the time. Let me just be not harsh, but straightforward and blunt. A lot of us want to talk about how Jesus is our king, but at the end of the day, our lives don't adequately reflect who he is and how he rules over our life. Too often we profess our allegiance, but we practice a self-reliance that denies his kingship. We can be like Israel and we can reject Jesus as the king. Or we can accept him as our king. And we can live in a way that will glorify him as our king. We're going to sing this song, and what I want you to think about is this. These are more than words and notes. These are a commitment that you and I, in the way we live our lives, will glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as we sing this, as we get ready to leave, we are making a commitment to ourselves, to each other, and to God to live as priests and kings that glorify and serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Think about that as Peyton comes forward and leads us. Let's all stand together, and after that, Chris will have our closing prayer. We will glorify the King of kings. Glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Alleluia to the King of kings. Alleluia to the Lamb. Alleluia to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Let's all pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you are a sovereign God, that you are the only true and living God. Father, we are thankful that you are holy, that you are righteous, that you are full of justice and truth. We're thankful that you are a God of mercy, a God of love. And Father, we are so thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus, that you have given to us, our King, our Lord, our Savior. And Father, your word tells us that he is the radiance of your glory and that he is the exact representation of your nature and father we see that in the sacrifice that he made for each one of us and how he denied himself and emptied himself on our behalf and father as we uh, you have given to us um, the ministry of this reconciliation this message that we are to take to the world and that you consider us ambassadors of you here on this earth we pray that we will 
take on that image as well, that we will take on your nature and your image, and that we will be busying ourselves, building your kingdom and not our own. Father, we rejoice that you have added Kaya Williams to your kingdom. We are so thankful for our new sister, and we rejoice as heaven rejoices. Father, we are also grateful and joyful and thankful for the progress that Katie has made, and we pray that as you are the great healer, that you will just touch her, touch her and heal her completely and restore her back to Austin, Avery, and Mac and her place and her family and her service to you. And Father, we pray that as we all go through ups and downs in this life, that we will do all things in a way that glorifies you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.